Hello, my name is Jennifer Campos, and I want to welcome you here tonight to the Avalon Park Foundation to our education series. Tonight we're going to be doing a talk on um, poverty and homelessness. So before we get started, again, I want to um, welcome you for your time tonight. And before we get started, I would like to um, tell you a little bit about the Avalon Park Foundation. Um, we were founded in 2012. And we were founded as an organization for our community. I want to read to you a little bit about our mission statement. Some of you may not know exactly what the Avalon Park Foundation is or what we do. So um, this will just give you a little bit of insight into specifically um, why we exist and why we do what we do. So um, our mission is to preserve and improve the physical, social, and economic health of Avalon Park neighborhoods and community organizations to support neighborhood self-reliance and enhance the quality of life for the residents through community-based problem-solving, neighborhood-oriented services, and public and private cooperation. So we're really here for our community. Um, we started the education series, we just started it up again this year, and we're gonna be doing Facebook Live videos so people in our community can watch this at their convenience. But the education series is for us to be able to present topics of interest to the residents in the community, to provide information, to educate, and also to provide resources for topics of interest. So our first education series was on autism, and our second one tonight is gonna be specifically talking about poverty and homelessness. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker tonight, and that is um, Eric Gray. So Eric Gray is the director of UP, which is United Against Poverty. So Eric has a lot of great information to share with us tonight, specifically on poverty and on homeless. I think um, each of us knows that homelessness is an issue here in Orlando, in East Orlando, and even closer to our community. We see um, homeless on the side streets and when we're out and about. So I think it's a very important topic um, and also something that's near and dear to my heart and learning how we can help people when we see them, but also learning about what are some of the issues that cause homelessness. So I'd like to introduce Eric. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, this is particularly nice because uh, this is my community too. Um, I lived in Eastwood for about 15 years and then just about two years ago moved to Waterford Lakes. Um, and I spend a lot of time at the Tanya King Park over here as a youth soccer coach, so I feel like this is a second home. Um, I, I never say this in any of my intros or bios or anything, but it's not even on my resume, but uh, this particular group will be the only one that appreciates me. That I was, um, I don't have a lot of awards in my life. I think I may have one. I think it was this one. That I was the Avalon Park YMCA Volunteer of the Year in 2014. So that's, I think that's about it. That's the, the extent of my, my work. So thank you guys for, um, for having me out here tonight. Um, decisions get made by those who show up, and I really appreciate you showing up to these types of functions. Um, these are, this is how communities get built. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with lots of different communities uh, in my life, and uh, it's the people who show up that get a say in things, and if you don't, you, you don't get a say in anything. And so it's, it's really nice to uh, see friendly faces that are willing to participate and stuff. So hopefully I can uh, educate a little bit tonight. That's my only purpose here tonight, just to, to, to teach a little. Um, and uh, I hope that when you start to nod off a little bit, you will ask questions. Uh, that would be a good way to keep you awake. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about poverty and homelessness. Uh, and I want to start off by um, sharing a little bit about my organization, and, and then I'm going to go into to the substance of the talk here. Uh, but just for context, I do run a nonprofit here in Orlando called United Against Poverty Orlando. We're located uh, downtown Orlando, 150 West Michigan. Uh, we're just south of the Orlando Regional Medical Center. And the facility is about a 50,000 square foot warehouse that was built during World War II that we have converted into a large grocery and medical clinic and classroom setting and a lot of other functions. We have 27 nonprofits that do some type of work at our site, but the primary, um, program that we have there is called the Success Training Employment Program, which is specifically geared towards helping lift families out of poverty. And there's nothing magical about it, uh, it's a lot of hard work, but we work to get people in jobs and help them stay in those jobs. So people who have very high barriers to employment, or maybe have struggled to find employment, we work with them over a very extensive process to get them back, in, back to work. And my larger program um, is the grocery, 
where I see about 500 people a day um, out at our, our Kosher grocery program. And that program offers uh, discounted groceries, about 60 to 70% off what you might get at the uh, Publix around the corner. Um, and that's available to families who meet our income qualifications. Those are on the cards I laid out, but if your family is uh, four, is earning about $45,000 a year or less, then you would qualify for the program, and it adjusts based on the size of your family. So um, if you know anybody, I left some information here. These are actually uh, little uh, vouchers for $10 in free groceries, no strings attached, that you can uh, keep in your glove box in case you know anybody, see anybody, uh, hear of anybody that might need a little extra support. And I can tell you because um, I uh, looked before I came, and we have over a thousand members from the 32828 zip code. Um, I can't narrow it down to Avalon Park addresses or anything like that, but um, we do have a lot of families um, in, in this area. And I personally helped uh, um, at least five families, I had to go back in my mind uh, over the last five years, that um, experienced homelessness and their, their residence before that was here in Avalon Park. Um, I mentioned at a function um, earlier uh, that, uh, that there was a certain number of uh, children who have experienced homelessness in our schools and I, I had to double check my number um, with uh, uh, Christina Savina who's the, the head of homelessness initiatives for Orange County Public Schools and the number at Timber Creek High School this last school year uh, was 46 I think I said 56 earlier and it's actually 46 students who experienced homelessness uh, at some point this last year it's about one and a half percent of the school population and um, it's hard to wrap your mind around some of these numbers, so I'm gonna do my best to try and, and uh, give you some context for numbers uh, today. So I'm gonna start off with uh, this talk that I've given probably uh, at least 200 times in the last four years, and I'm always happy to do it because I really feel strongly that people ought to know all the things they can about the community they live in. Uh, so we start off by asking, you know, what are some of the things that Orlando or Central Florida are really best at? Can you think of anything where we are number one um, in a particular category? Rain. <laughs> Tourism. And what rain. was rain? Rain. Yeah, like right now. Hot weather. Hot weather. Lightning. Lightning. Yeah, we actually have been the lightning capital of the world back and forth with Tampa, and it was just taken over by a city in Mississippi this year, oh, good. Uh, oddly hot. enough, yeah. uh, <laughs> for the very first time. Um, and we are number one in tourism. Does anybody know how many people visited Orlando um, last year? 70 million. Yes, it was over 70 million, 77 million. And, and to put into context, um, so I always write, write this up here. Um, 77 million is a big number, but you have to think, like, what does that mean? I mean, there's two and, two and a half million people who live in Orange, Seminole, and Osceola County. Right? A little over a million and a half people who live just in Orange County. But the, the way I like to give it a little bit more context is, does anyone know what the second and third most popular cities in the world are? You want to take a guess? Las Vegas. It's a good guess. It's not, not one of Mexico them. City. Paris is one of them. Mexico City is high on the list. It's not one of the, it's not one of the top three. And New York. So New York's number two. They had over 60 million visitors last year. And Paris is number three, and they had just over 25 million visitors last Ooh. year. So just to put into context, three times as many people visited Little Lord Orlando mm -hmm. and came to Paris last year. And it's just an amazing thing to think that our community is literally the most popular place in the known universe. And it's a great place to live. I love it being here too. It's a great place to visit, but we have hundreds of thousands of people here in this community every single day that are, you know, are brand new to the community. What are some other areas that Orlando is known for being number one in? We were number one in um, traffic fatalities for people walking across the street. We have been at various times during the last 20 years uh, the, the largest or highest uh, per capita rate of pedestrian fatalities. I'm just, I'm just going to take a stab at homelessness since you're getting the So we have been um, at, at the top of the list of homelessness um, uh, a couple different occasions. Uh, about three or four years ago, we were listed as the highest um, number of chronically homeless mm -hmm. adults in the United States for mid-sized cities. So the Orlando Metro is the uh, 23rd largest metropolitan area. So it's really hard to compare cities to cities because the city of Orlando is actually relatively small. 
uh, if you compare to like Jacksonville, which is literally the largest city in the world by land mass, um, Orlando is actually a relatively small city limits. But when you look at the metropolitan area, the way the federal government defines us, Orange, Seminole, and Osceola County, we're the 23rd largest market. And we have the ninth largest school district here in Orange County. We're the 13th largest media market. And this is a really substantially large community. And so to have the, the distinction as having more chronically homeless uh, men and women uh, at various points is, is kind of a big deal. So yes, we were at one point, and it changes, um, known as the leader in chronically homeless adults. We've also been um, number one in the number of or the rate of children who are homeless. So nationally, the rate is around one in 40 children are homeless. In Orlando, in the most recent study, that number was one in 17. Mm -hmm. So we have a very high rate of childhood homelessness. We're also number one in a kind of a, in a negative area, kind of like homelessness is, um, and that is in the median wage uh, overall. So, you, so the median wage gets uh, kind of pushed under the rug by its uh, big brother minimum wage in discussions all the time. Everybody wants to talk about minimum wage, but nobody ever talks about median wage. And the uh, Orlando market is known for over the last 25 years, in 20 of those years, we've had the lowest median wage of any of the top 100 major metropolitan areas in the United States. So we're number one in low wages. Now, every time I say the word wage, people have a certain connotation that they place to that. Some people think immediately that I'm a communist because I use the word wage in a sentence. I, mean, I get that a lot. Some people think that I'm advocating for a minimum wage because I just used it in a, in a statement. I don't know what else to call it. It's not a political statement. It's not a statement of opinion. It just is. This is a Department of Labor and US Census data fact that Orlando has the lowest median wage um, of any major city in the United States. Median, for those of you who haven't taken seventh grade math in a while, because um, I, had, I had to look this up, um, median is simply the middle. So if you lined up everybody in our community, shoulder to shoulder, and organize them by highest to lowest wage, and you pick the person in the middle, that person is the median wage for our community. Does anybody want to take a guess you're not going to get it right. It's okay. That's why I like to. I just want to keep everybody awake. What's the median wage in this community? Thirty-two. Thirty-two thousand a year. Forty-two. Forty-two. These are all good guesses. Anybody else? Higher, lower? Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. So you guys are all you're all in the ballpark. When I first started giving this talk uh, about four years ago, I would have much higher and lower ranges. I know when I'm making an impact, when I know every time I give this talk, everybody gets closer and closer to the number. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it, maybe it's not uh, my, uh, my accomplishment, but I, I like to believe that it's my accomplishment, so I'm gonna tell myself that. So the median annual income in Orlando is $29,781 mm -hmm. annually. And that means for individual adults, not for households, but just individual adults. Now. When I first started talking about this to people, I still got sort of a glazed over look, like, okay, we're a low wage community. What do you expect? It's a tourism community. That's just, it is what it is. And I had a hard time putting it into context because from my perspective, I see hundreds of families every day, 30,000 a year come to my facility that fall into the low wage category and they are struggling and yes, they. Many of them work in the tourism quarter, many of them don't. That doesn't mean that it's okay. It doesn't mean that it's good or bad, it just is. So I'd like to put into context what that means. So I started studying what does it cost to live here, right? So you have a couple major areas where most everybody spends money. Housing is the most significant portion of a family's budget uh, in this day and age. Utilities come along with that, even though they're not as significant a size, they, they come hand in hand. Transportation is the second most significant part of a family's budget, followed by food and then, um, in this case, uh, medical care. Now, I, I excluded child care because it doesn't attribute to everybody, but if, if it did, it would be significantly high on this list, in some cases, more than food. Food used to be the biggest part of any family's budget. And in 1963, when the U.S. government first put out a poverty rate, the statistic was actually put together based on food. 
there was an Eastern European immigrant that worked in the, in the White House named Molly Orshansky, and she was asked by the Kennedy administration to put together this statistic. And she based the idea of who's poor and who's not off of the most expensive thing in people's budgets, which was food. And the most expensive food item in 1963 was what? For most people. They spent the most money. They just felt like this was the most expensive thing that I had to buy all the time. Meat. No, it was close. No. No. Milk. No. Milk was the driving factor for the poverty rate in this country for 30 years. And that's why you hear so many people talk about, do you know what the price of a gallon of milk is? And why when politicians aren't able to answer that question, they're out of touch? It's because it was an important statistic. And it still is. But it was very important you know, 30 years ago. So when we look at the cost of things and the poverty rate, it's all a calculation put together by the federal government. Now, we've gotten much better at it in the last 20 years, and it's adjusted uh, by different categories, and it's a much more complicated algorithm. The challenge is that the poverty rate in Tucson is the same as in Tallahassee, right? And, and it's no different than whether the cost of living is higher or lower. And so the cost of living in New York City versus the cost of living in Orlando is not taken into consideration. So poverty is something that is hard for people to wrap their minds around because there's so much data to have to try to wrap their minds around. So what I try to do is just talk a little bit about the average costs of things. And the average cost of housing um, in this particular market for somebody annually, they're going to be spending about $11,664 a year on housing. Right? And then on utilities, it's about $1,800 and $36 a year. And for transportation, you're gonna end up spending roughly $7,000 a year. And the cost of food works out to be 4,356. And medical expenses, 3,660. And this is based on a family of four? This is based on a single individual uh, as the average, in this case, for living in the state of Florida. Now, the household is taking consideration basically all households, whether it's a single person or, or a person, because they don't uh, they don't have statistics for how much does it cost to live in a, uh, a one person household. That's not something that's calculated. But when you add all these up and you you get to the statistic, and I haven't done this in a while, so if anybody wants to help me and add these up and, and uh, take into account, if my math is correct from uh, when I when I did this before, um, the number here you end up in a deficit. And it's about it's about fourteen hundred dollar deficit. If somebody wants to pull out the calculator and check me, since this is being recorded for posterity, you know, they, can, they can help me. Out. So, what does this not include? What kind of expenses? I already said childcare. What else does it not include? Clothing. Right. Clothing. Entertainment. Entertainment of any type. School education. Sure. If you have school expenses. Not everybody would, but some people do. And I have four children in Orange County Public Schools, so I know how much it costs. Ooh. Buy a lot of hand sanitizer at the beginning of the year. <laughs> 1265 So she's, she's got me corrected. Good. It doesn't include savings. It doesn't include cell phones. And having spent a night in a homeless shelter in the last couple of years because of the programs that I, I work with and seen... Uh, this fact, everybody has a cell phone, everybody, no matter what your income level, because you have to. In order to keep a job in this community, you have to have a cell phone. It's, it's not possible to exist without it. Come on in, guys. And then when you, you think about it, it also doesn't include taxes. This is it. This 29000 is a pre-tax number. And God forbid in the vacation capital of the world that anybody might have a vacation of that pretty that limit. And so the reason I share this is because when we got lost in the minimum wage conversation, what gets forgotten often is the median wage. And remember, this is half the community that I just dropped into that conversation. And then people start to think, well, yeah, but what if it's a two-income household? What if there's one child, two children? What, you know, what if there's a uh, grandmother living with them? There's all these different scenarios. All that's true. So I go back to my very first statistic here, that in the largest tourism community in the world, in the most popular city in the known universe, 
we have the lowest wages of any major city. So however you want to compare it, when you compare it to our neighbors, we're at the bottom. And I don't care who you are, whether you're the NFL and you're looking at the QB rating, or you're looking at the wealthiest communities in the country, nobody wants to be last. And so in a community that has been last now for more than two decades, it's important to have these conversations because this has an impact on everybody's lives. This isn't something that happens around you. It's happening to you right now. And you are impacting this. You're included in these statistics if you have income. And it is something that you really have to grasp when you are showing up the meetings like this. Because how many of you have listened to anybody in the last 25 years in Orlando speak about the fact that they were running for elected office? And if you have, how many of you can remember any of them saying, I want to help Orlando not be the lowest income city in the country. <laughs> Have you ever heard anybody say that? Conveniently, Right. And so what happens is we try to avoid the topic as much as possible because it's very difficult to find solutions. And poverty is what leads to homelessness. A lot of people will say with homelessness that, well, it's a lot of people who are coming to Florida because it's much easier to be homeless here in the warm weather than it would be in the cold weather. And that's a common misconception, and I used to think that as well until I started, started studying and working in this area, but most people who are homeless in this community, in fact, more than 93% in the last statistic that was, uh, last study that was done, 93% of the people who are homeless in our community grew up in this community. Mm -hmm. People aren't getting on trains and buses to come here to be homeless. Mm -hmm. If you're homeless, it's because you were in a community and you had a living, you had support, and now you no longer do. The vast majority of people who are homeless, it's situational. It's, I lost my job, I have no family support in this community, I have no one to go to, I'm not willing to go to, or I have a mental health challenge that these are diagnosed or undiagnosed, or I just got out of prison and nobody's going to hire me and nobody wants to talk to me. These are all potential situations. What's really challenging about homelessness is that we don't have a really good handle on how many people are homeless. Mm -hmm. Study after study that's done is almost near impossible to get perfectly accurate. About two years ago, I had an opportunity to speak to uh, the head of Edison Research, Mr. Edison. Edison Research out of Maryland is the top research program in the country when it comes to people-based data. This is the company that when you're watching exit polls during a presidential race, and they're saying, 45% of precincts reply. This company does the exit polling for the entire country during every presidential race for all of the news outlets. And in speaking to Mr. Edison, I asked him a simple question. I said, I want to figure out how many children are sleeping in cars in Orlando in a given year. How do I do that? And he, he said, let me take it back to my staff because off the top of my head, I can't think of a way. And he took it back to his staff and he come back, came back to me and talked to me later and said, we cannot come up with a way to do it. There's no, there's no actual viable way to get that kind of data from anybody. People who are sleeping in their cars, in my opinion, is one of the biggest travesties that's happened in this community that we, we all see, we just don't know that we're seeing it. Oftentimes, when we're paying attention to people who are homeless, we're paying attention to the people flying the cardboard side sign at the bottom of the offering. Right? And there are a lot of people doing that. And a lot of those men and women are homeless. There's also a misconception that people are out there making money you know, to do that, and that's just their way they earn a living. I've done it. I've stood on the street corner and done it for a day, and I'm tell you, they're not doing it to make money. Right? If you make three bucks in a day, in a day, you've done a really good job. This is not something that people are doing because they want to. It's because they have no other options. Yes, it might be a substance abuse problem. It might be all kinds of things. And you can choose to help them or not help them, and I never judge anybody based on it. But that group of people only represents a small percentage of the number of people who are struggling in this community. If you took all of the people in the Orlando metro, and you looked at all the people who are considered living in poverty, and you were to put all of them evenly dispersed at every stoplight in Orange, Seminole, and Osceola County, 
you'd have 180 people at every stop now. Men, women, and children. That's the problem. These are the people who are most susceptible to being homeless. There are families in Avalon Park right now who will be sleeping in that public's parking lot tonight. Guarantee it. Do I know exactly who they are? No. But I know enough of them that I know the statistics on how frequent this happens to know that the shopping center parking lots, particularly grocery stores, particularly 24-hour grocery stores that are well lit in safe neighborhoods are the number one place where people are sleeping in their cars. And because you can use the restroom and, and other things. And they're not doing it because they want to. They're doing it because they have to. So there's a lot of people that are struggling with homelessness in the community we'll never really know. The Another data point to kind of think about is the number of people who are living in extreme poverty. So I mentioned your poverty is a certain level. It's about $12,000 a year in income for an individual. If you're earning, if you have another a dependent, you add another $4,000 to that. And so you have two people in the household, if you're at $16,000 in income or below, you're living in poverty. If you're double that, you're considered in the working poor. It's called 200% of U.S. poverty. But even below that is called extreme poverty. And that statistic is, if you're living on less than $2 a day. And it's the same statistic whether you're in Orlando, Omaha, or Sub-Saharan Africa, or anywhere on the planet, less than $2 a day. And in this community, it's most likely, because it's hard to study these, that about 2% of the population is living in extreme poverty at any given time. Remember, there's about 2.5 million people in the community overall. So we're talking about some really interesting numbers that most people really have a hard time wrapping their minds around. And I still have a hard time wrapping my mind around it as well. And the question that I always ask myself, which I know most other people ask me, which is, okay, well, what can I do about it? You know, what, if this is such a big problem, what can I do about it? Well, there's the, there's the macro picture and the micro picture here. On a macro level, what you can do about it is, you know, build a business, hire more people, and help people make more money and pay them you know, competitive wages. That's the number one thing people can do, get people into jobs. If you don't own a small business and, and you and you're don't aren't a part of a large business and you're, you're hiring people, it's hard to have that kind of impact. But at the macro level, I encourage you to listen for that when people who are wanting to leave, and I can just see up the window now, yard signs in the, you know, for people running for office in the August 20th primary. If you don't hear them talking about the fact that you live in the lowest wage community in the United States, they're probably not in touch with what's going on. And you might say, well, they're a school board member, what are they really gonna do about it? Well, every school in Orange County, without exception, has at least one student who was homeless last year. Actually, none of them had less than five. So, we're talking about a major problem, whether you're a school board member, a city council member, a county commissioner, a mayor, a US representative, senator, governor, or anybody else. This is an issue that you know should be, at least somewhat, on the minds of every Floridian, not just in Orlando. When you look at average or household uh, wage as opposed to individual wage, Orlando's not the bottom. We're the third from the bottom. The two cities below us with household median wage is Tampa and Miami. This is a problem across the state. And so people will start to think, you know, what can I do about it? Well, again, macro picture, it's helpful to know why this is the case. Why did, why did we get this place? Why is this unique in Florida overall? Well, I'm not an expert, I'm not an economist, but I'll tell you what my, my opinion is on this. It's not because of tourism. It's not tourism's fault. It's not anybody's fault. In Orlando specifically, it's a challenge because we are one of the largest cities in the world, not on a navigable body of water no river, we have no ocean port. And so because of that, when the city was founded uh, just pre-Civil War in the 1850s, we had no manufacturing base to build from. The port that was closest to us was actually in Sanford on Lake Jessup at the headwaters of the St. Johns River. And the community should have been platted there, but for a little uh, trickery with the vote when we set county boundaries and turned this from Mosquito County into Orange County, the county seat got platted near Fort Gatlin, which is uh, very close to where Lake Yola is now. It's about four miles north, four miles south of Lake Yola, instead of Fort Jessup. And it's because the owner of all the land around Fort Gatlin threw a big shindig 
big whiskey and barbecue fest on the day of the vote and invited all the soldiers from all the forts to come in. He said, by the way, since you're here, why don't you vote for Fort Gatlin to be the new county seat? And that's how you got the county seat here. And because he was a Shakespearean fan, he named all of his pets after Shakespeare characters. And one of them was a dog named after a character in As You Like It. And so the city of Orlando is named after a dog who was owned by the landowner around Fort Gatlin, who was smart enough to figure out a way to make his land more valuable and turn this into the county seat for what became Orange County. Mm. So the city's built up uh, in kind of a false way around um, a, a non-ported city whose industry originally was cattle and then citrus and then the land became more valuable for other things and ultimately Walt Disney's um, parents who had retired to Eustis was familiar with the area. Their secondary location after the St. Louis site where they were gonna build their second park was Orlando. They chose the Orlando site instead of St. Louis, and now, you know, all these years later, we're the number one tourist destination in the world. It's not anybody's fault. This is just the way the community has grown up over time. 4.1% of our jobs are manufacturing. That's the lowest per such percentage of any major city in the country. We have 21% of our jobs are service industry jobs, with the second largest behind Las Vegas. Service sector jobs not only pay less than manufacturing jobs, they also don't spin off other industries. Manufacturing jobs are going to spin off other businesses, other jobs, and it's going to be a little bit more ingrained in the community as a whole. The other problem with service sector jobs in this community is there's very few owners that live in this community. Harris Rosen's one of the few who actually owns a hotel and lives in a hotel. So he has to step over homeless people on his way into synagogue, just like Dr. Philip Phillips did. And he used to talk about this when he was still alive. But the people who own Walt Disney are in Anaheim or New York, the people who own Universal, the people who own SeaWorld, they don't live in this community. And that's okay, that's the way for a lot of communities. But when you don't live in the community, you're not gonna be invested in the community. And so we have a lot of big corporations here that don't have their CEOs in this community. And because of that, we are really the only major city in the country now without a Fortune 500 company headquartered here, at least in Orlando. The closest would be Tupperware down in Kissimmee. We used to, Darden, but then Darden sold off our lobster. We used to have um, Hughes Supply, then Home Depot bought them out and now it's headquartered in Atlanta. All of these things work together to suppress a community's income because we are adding jobs in the wrong way. Governor Scott loved what he's trying to do is get people back to work. He's been doing it for the last eight years. He goes to every ribbon cutting anywhere in the state when there's a new business came to Orlando to a ribbon cutting when they started opening Wawa restaurants or Wawa gas stations. That's great. I'm glad Wawa came here, but they're not adding any jobs that are above the median wage. Amazon is setting up a new distribution facility here. The county was going to, was considering supporting them financially to move here, except none of the jobs were above median wage. So why support a new business moving into the community that's only going to suppress the overall incomes for the community? I'm all about bringing new businesses in but I don't want my tax money to support them if it's not going to raise the standard of living in the community. We don't necessarily need more jobs. Unemployment in this community is 3.4%. We have actually more jobs than we have people. What we need is higher wage jobs. The problem is higher wage jobs require higher skilled workers, and Orlando struggles with that too. The top three reasons why businesses don't move to this community to help us increase our median wage and thus reduce our homeless problem is number one, lack of skilled labor. And number two and three is lack of skilled labor. And everybody will tell you that if you, if you talk to them about it. Lack of skilled labor is a product of the school system here pushing children to college and not to other types of outlets. Now, I want all of my children to go to college too. And I have had two children go through Discovery Middle School. And in the cafeteria at Discovery, they have flags hanging from the, from the ceiling. It's beautiful. All these colleges, except 64% of the students in that lunchroom every day during the school year will never get a college degree. They might go to college, but they're never going to get a degree. Only 36% of Orange County students will actually receive an AA or higher. 91% of them will graduate high school, but with a high school degree only, what are you going to do with that in this market? You're trained to flip burgers or fold sheets or maybe help with landscaping, but that's really about it overall. So just like in the 90s when we were pushing families to home ownership, and we kept saying, everybody ought to own a home. 
Well, that turned out to not necessarily be such a good idea when we learned that in the Great Recession. I'd like for everybody to own a home too, just like I'd like for everybody to go to college, but it's not necessarily what's gonna happen. So going to college needs to be an option, not the option. And of course we have Valencia, and we have other uh, great community college programs and state colleges here, but that's included in this statistic. I said AA or higher, only 36%. We have wonderful programs here. Orange Technical College, which has a campus here in Avalon and, and four other campuses in the community, has dozens of programs that if the, peop, that the students went through it, they would have a lot more opportunity for higher wage jobs. The challenge is that most of the students who are going to Orange Technical College are not doing that until 25 or older. So between 18 and 25, they're figuring out that, wait, I should have done this earlier. In Orange County, every student gets uh, the SAT cost taken care of for them. Every student takes the SAT, which is fantastic. Not very many counties do that. But only 64, or only 36% of the students will actually ever need that SAT. So what, what I've been encouraging, and others have too, is to have them take technical college exams as well. So don't have them wait until they're 25 to take that college, that, that, that entrance exam in a technical college. It's gonna be a lot easier when you're 18, fresh out of school, than when you're 25 and you haven't been in school for six years. So all of this leads to this homeless problem on a macro level. That's the big picture stuff. Right? On a micro level, we get into, should I give change to the guy at the street corner or not? And I will tell you, I sometimes do it and sometimes I don't. And I kind of know what to look for, for because of my job, but I also see the same people a lot. And if I've supported them once, it might be a little while before I support them again. I know a lot of people who will never roll down their windows because of safety, and I perfectly respect that. But what I would encourage you to do as often as possible is don't avoid them. Don't not look at them. Because having done it myself, having stood on the side of a street, having sat on a corner in downtown, having been in a homeless shelter overnight, I can tell you that it's really tough to have people go past you and not look at you. So one of the number one things you can do is acknowledge them. Just like in the macro level, we need people to acknowledge that there is a problem. It's just like any addiction. You know, you got to acknowledge that there's a problem first. In Orlando, we are addicted to low wage jobs. If you want to address the problem at a, at a smaller micro level, acknowledge the problem. Look at these guys, these women in the eye, say hello. I'm not gonna give you anything today, but I at least wanted to say hi. Good luck to you. God bless you. you know, Merry Christmas. Anything you wanna say, the idea that you've made eye contact with them is so important. I, I cannot overstate that. The other is find a way to get to know your neighbors. Because the number one reason I hear that people are in situational homelessness after the idea that they have no income to pay their bills is because they had no support system around them. Mm -hmm. Now, many of us have an extra bedroom, we have a couch, and we can support people for a period of time. And if you do want to support people, set up the rules at the front end. I can do this for you, it's going to be a week. And after that, we need to have a, an agreement that it's not going to be, or it's going to be three days, or it's going to be 30 days, whatever you decide. But the idea that if you know your neighbors, and how many of us can actually say we know all of our neighbors on a first name basis on our right and on our left and across from us. That's great, right? If you get to know your neighbors, it creates a better support system in the community. You may say, well, Eric, that's great. That all sounds great. You wanna look people in the eye and you wanna to get to know your neighbors. But that's how it works in this community. That's how you support people. You can get involved in charity in the community. There's a lot of great charities in this community. The number one place for people to go in need is gonna be the church any church, take your pick. But if you're active in a church, find out what your church is doing to support people. And what I encourage you to do with your church, in addition to getting involved, is get involved the right way and encourage your church to do it the right way. Personally, I believe churches ought to be offering a hand up as opposed to a handout. The idea of giving away food is very noble. But if they're giving away food without building some type of relationship with that person about really knowing what they're doing, it's really tough to get, it's tough to, to know, are you really making an impact? Are they going and getting food from this place and then two doors down, eat it from another and two doors down, eating it from another? 
emergency food has its place. But when does it stop being an emergency? Is it after 30 days, 30 months? We have people that come to our program that have been on emergency food assistance for multiple generations. And if that's the only way you can procure food, then that's the only way you can procure food. But I had a neighbor in Waterford Lakes reach out to me early last week, and she really didn't want to talk. And she, she knew people I knew. She's like, please don't tell your wife. And I said, of course. She's going to be evicted from her apartment. She had, her daughter was living with her, her dad in another state for the summer, and she was so afraid that her daughter was going to come back, go into Timber Creek, and not have a place to stay. And so all I did with her was say, here are the resources available to you. And I forwarded them to her via text. I said, start calling these places one at a time. Start explaining what's going on. And it's going to start opening up your mind a little bit, and you're going to find a way to find a path. Because what oftentimes is people will self-correct. They just need that little bit of support. This is something I really struggled with starting my job. I, in my first year at United Against Poverty, was helping some folks at the, at the registers. One uh, young woman had a four-year-old that looked like she was giving her a hard time. I helped her out to her car with her groceries, but she didn't really want my help. So I helped anyway because the little girl was really giving her a hard time. We get to her car. She pops the, the trunk on her little hatchback. The little girl runs away a few feet. She has to scurry over to grab her. I decided to take it upon myself to start loading groceries in her car. She comes up, kind of body blocks me. No, no, don't worry about it. And it became very quickly apparent that the reason she did that is because she's living in the car. And you can just look in the car and see that she's living in the car. So we finished loading the groceries. She gets in the car, buckles her daughter in, pulls away, and I did nothing. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I was so flabbergasted. I just didn't know what to, to do. And so what I concentrated on after that point was trying to figure out what do I say in the moment? And I've learned a lot about the resources available in this community. I don't expect my neighbors and my friends to low all the resources in this community. I encourage you to tell people to call 211. Right? That's the United Ways hotline, and they have a great resource in this community for getting you to the right type of assistance. For example, the woman that I referenced earlier this week, she specifically called United Way's uh, line, talked to their legal representation about eviction issues, re figured out what her rights are, and she really had six more months in the apartment. So she had time to, to figure things out. And that's all, all it really took. So two on one is easy to remember. And if you can't remember it, just remember United Way. Just remember that there's a hotline out there somewhere and, and it exists because in Orlando, the United Way here is amazing, and they operate the two-on-one system for most of the southeast all out of Orlando. And they do a really good job of it. So knowing you know, what the problem is in the community, acknowledging that it exists, knowing that there are people around you that may need support, paying attention to what's going on in the community, the idea that there is a problem and our elected leaders you know, ought to be discussing it, knowing what the resources are, in the community such that you can offer that assistance when it's needed. Those are all things that you can do to assist. There are some pretty incredible initiatives going on in this community. There's one right now that Dr. Joel Hunter from Northland Church uh, formerly is working on to connect all of the churches in the community through a database system. I use a national database system so if somebody goes to the coalition or the healthcare center for the homeless and then comes to me, I know it and I can support the different initiatives. A lot of people think, God, it's just a disaster out there. There's nothing happening. There's, no, there's some really amazing activities happening, not just in Orlando, but all over the United States. And support them. Find a way to financially support any way you can, or even better, find a way to volunteer. I'll kind of I'll kind of end with a plug for my organization, but you can do this with a lot of places. We do a family volunteer night on the second Friday of every month uh, from 5 to 8 o'clock. There's a lot of people here in the Avalon area that come out because they know me, and they bring their kids out. We have pizza, and they put them to work. A lot of people have this idea when you have kids, like, I'm going to take my kids to the soup kitchen on Thanksgiving because I can show them the value of hard work and what it's like for the other half. The problem is there is no soup kitchen in Orlando. There are some places kind of like a soup kitchen, but there's literally actually no actual soup kitchen. Plus, you can't just walk in with kids to some of these shelters and just start volunteering. There's protocol, and it's not always safe. But there are opportunities for children to get involved 
And more importantly, there's opportunities for you to get involved. At our organization, one of the easiest is to show up on the second Friday of any month, 12 months a year, from five to eight o'clock, we're gonna put you to work. It's a lot of fun stocking shelves, bagging groceries, helping out, cleaning up, and we don't waste anybody's time. You can also volunteer at Second Harvest Food Bank. They have an amazing program. The Coalition for the Homeless has an incredible program. Harbor House of Central Florida, which is an amazing domestic abuse program here, has some uh, very, very top-end volunteer opportunities. You have to go through some training with them because it's, it's pretty specific. There's some wonderful programs. And United Way has a great volunteer hub outlet that you can talk to the folks at United Way. You can tell them your specific interests and, and, and needs, and they can kind of get you to the right place. They're really good at that, too. And the volunteer coordinator there is a friend of mine. She just does a great job. You can also hold on to one of these, and I brought plenty of cards here. And if, uh, if you'd ever like uh, any more or anybody that's on Facebook, uh, you can get them from our site, United Against Poverty. Um, or if you know me here in Avalon, you can look me up and I'll bring them to you. These are just $10 coupons for our store. And whenever I see people on the side of the road, this is what I give them. This is what I, I, I do to support people. Um, and I talk to them a little bit. I'm able to kind of have a conversation with them about what's going on. Um, and this is a no strings attached $10 gift card. It's worth about 30 bucks in groceries because of the way we're discounted. And it has instructions on what we do and other programs, and, and that's, that's what we work on here. So I talked to you guys for a very long time, um, and I appreciate nobody falling asleep. Um, uh, and, but they told me to, to take up a certain amount of time, and I wanted to make sure I was giving you a bang for your buck tonight because I know everybody paid big ticket to come here tonight. So ask me some questions. Yeah, please. How did you get involved in this? How, how did you get what made what gave you the passion to start this? So I didn't start this organization. It started well before me uh, by a small church in Winter Park, and they did an amazing job of, of uh, taking this concept and building it over the last uh, almost 18 years. Um, I got involved in the nonprofit sector through some work I did at the University of Florida while I was in college just as a student, and I was very fortunate enough to have a job opportunity out of school that got me into the nonprofit sector, and I've been in it ever since. And um, it, for me, it's there is a passion to it, but I have four kids. And this is my job, this is my career, and I, I do this as a, as a profession. And um, I'm really lucky to have the opportunity to do it, but it's, uh, it's also just a job. And you know, we have other things that we do in our lives, and if I didn't have a job, I'd be one of my clients, just like that. Uh, a few years ago, we had Brent Trotter speak from yeah. the Coalition for the Home. How do you all interact? How, how, is, how is the network work? So uh, the Coalition is one of three emergency shelters in this community, uh, in Orange County. Uh, there are none in Osceola County, and there's only one in Seminole County. Uh, the other two besides the Coalition for the Homeless are the Salvation Army and the Orlando Union Rescue Mission. All three are wonderful organizations. Uh, the Coalition is an independent organization. It's not affiliated with anything nationally. They are supported in small ways by the city and the county, uh, but most of their support comes from uh, individual private donations, mostly just people like you. And they have, I, um, I don't know the number of beds because they've done some expansion work over there, but they are full all the time. And, 500 million. Yeah, it, it, it's probably not quite that many, but it's, it's, a, it's a lot. So, they, so what they do is you can go over to the coalition a certain time of day, you get in line, and they're going to th go through a process and, uh, and check you in. And if they have available space, they're going to they're gonna get you in there. If they don't, they're going to tell you that. But uh, the coalition is all about trying to help people get out of those situations, too. And so we all use a, a database system called the Homeless Management Information System, or HMIS. And this is a national system, and all of the larger uh, nonprofit organizations and uh, social service agencies all use this system. And so if you are entered into that system, it's because you've signed a, uh, an agreement saying you, you're okay with that, and you've given them uh, some personal information. Uh, not everybody has access to it. You have to go through training to, to do it, uh, but I can see uh, where that person has been in any other agency that uses the system. I can see the plans that are there, and we all coordinate with each other on those plans. And so um, it, the idea here is trying to work together and by not duplicating a lot of our work. That's the biggest thing that, that we do with the coalition overall. Other questions? Hey. Where is the coalition located? The coalition is downtown. Um, I say that, I'm gonna forget the street. I think it's on Central. It's just west of the downtown uh, core. Uh, so if you were to uh, kind of be in front of Amway Arena and just start going west on Church Street, it's, it's uh, just a few blocks down that way. So what about people that are here east of us? 
they have a hard time getting downtown to help. Yeah, uh, there's not a lot of good answer for that. Uh, what ends up happening, uh, if they can get onto the bus system, you know, or make their way to, to the shelter experiences, but most people who experience homelessness are not using shelters. You, know, so you, you only have so many beds that are available. Uh -huh. Most people that are experiencing homelessness are um, uh, living on a couch, they're living in their car, mm -hmm. they're living in a rented storage unit, or they're living in the woods, and it's yeah. kind of in that order. There are a number of places in this community um, in wooded areas where there are camps. Mm -hmm. uh, there are um, at least two here in Avalon Park that I'm aware of. There are a couple on University Boulevard. Uh, there's a couple up here on Alafaya near Lowe's. Um, and when I say camps, I, I don't mean you know, thousands of people. It might just be three or four people. Yeah. But um, these are these are wooded areas where they're out of sight. These are empty lots for the most part that nobody's, they're not causing problems for anybody. And um, that might be um, where some of the more chronically homeless adults, chronically meaning that they have a disability of some type, mm -hmm. mental or physical, and they've been um, without housing for a so the, the camps um, that exist in East Orlando are pretty prevalent uh, compared to the rest of the county. That's mm -hmm. kind of what East Orlando is known for. Mm -hmm. If you got in a helicopter with the sheriff's office, um, you, you kind of thought you'd see a lot of the camps in this area. Okay. But uh, not a not a really great answer to that question. Sorry. So, so how do we so how do we help those people because yeah. they're the closest to us? Exactly. Well, it's it's tough because I really would never recommend that anyone go into the camps. Um, if you are dead set on it, um, you really need to make sure that you're doing it during the daytime. Uh, you need to make sure that you're doing it with a couple of people, not just by yourself. And you might even consider calling the Orange County Sheriff's Office and telling them that what you're planning to do and they might have an officer just go out and sit nearby. And that sounds kind of like a drastic thing to say out loud, but um, it's, it's really a smart thing to do. Um, not because people are necessarily uh, meaning you ill will, but there are, are the idea of being chronically homeless is that, by definition, you have a disability, and sometimes those are mental disabilities, and so you just have to be cautious with it. Um, the people in the camps, they might need water, um, just like anybody else, and, you know, as, a, as a necessity. They, they might need food. Um, typically, clothing's not a, a big need. Uh, uh, tents are not typically big need because they have them, but if you have a tent, you know, that you have to be of assistance. They need money. <coughs> You know, they need money to, to buy things that they need to survive, and they need jobs. And if you have a job, and you know of jobs available, that's sometimes the best thing that you can do, is let people know about those jobs. You can also, if you know of jobs available, let Career Source Central Florida know about the jobs. Um, they're the state-funded agency that a lot of people that are struggling to find employment will go to. Uh, it's the one that, that most everybody knows about. Also, Goodwill um, is a really good job at, at placing people. And in my organization, does the same. We, we place people in a lot of jobs, and if you know of things that are available, whether it's you know, uh, you know Home Depot or uh, you know, a haircut place here in Avalon or anything like that, you just let people know, and uh, and that that's sometimes a, a best way to help. There's no really great answer to say you should mobilize an initiative to collect pennies to do this one thing. What I because I I, I I never have a great answer to that question, and I always struggle with it. My best answer is to say, pick one thing that you can do every year and keep doing it. Even if that means you're going one place to volunteer to help out stock shelves or serve food or color pictures with kids. Just that idea, it's more important that you go out once a year for 10 years for one day each as opposed to going for 10 days in a row. That consistency is what builds community and helps build solutions, as opposed to people just doing it once. Because the nonprofit organizations, the churches, the government agencies, they can't build off people's one-time experience. Mm -hmm. But the commitment just to do one thing once a year is sometimes the best thing people can do. What is, what is your success rate in your program? Or how do you measure? So in our primary program, the Success Training and Employment Program, we have been doing that now for about two years, and we have um, a graduation rate of about 83%. That doesn't necessarily mean success, that just means they've gone through our six-week program. And we have a higher rate of about 50%, meaning of the people going through the program, we're getting them jobs about 50% of the time. We're actually doing better than that, but we don't do such a good job of uh, keeping in touch with people 
because not everybody wants to be kept in touch with. But uh, that's our, our success rate right now is about 50%. This year, um, the numbers are still small because we're still new in the program. But this year, since January, we've um, verified the 10 families out of poverty and another 10 that are above 200% of U.S. poverty, what we call self-sufficient because they no longer qualify for any government assistance. Um, and our goal by the end of the year is 25 families above that 200% mark. And by the end of 2021, our goal is 300 families um, each year. And that's what we're striving for. So we put all of our efforts in this one program to try to make that happen. Success with grocery is we've been keeping, uh, because we continue to successfully solicit food from now 14 states, uh, 68 donors, um, and we have uh, over 30,000 members, we're serving uh, more than 16% of the qualified Orange County population. So there's um, a lot of families in the community that, that qualify and we're serving a big portion of them. And right now our uh, cost um, uh, for the groceries is about 37 cents on the dollar or roughly 63% discount on groceries. And we, we strive to be at 33 cents and we're not, we're not quite at that place where we've been able to sustain it for a, a year. That's, that's our, our outcomes at the moment. And we, this year we'll save member families somewhere between 4.6 and $5 million. That's the goal. Um, and I think we'll, we'll be above the 4.6. I'm not sure about the 5 million. Near us uh, is the Woodbury Food Pantry. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they serve about 300 every Monday or so. How many places like that are there around Orange County that hand out food? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I don't know the exact number, but it's in the hundreds. So, you know, I think probably in Orange Settlement and Osceola County, Best guess, I would say there's probably 150 mm -hmm. to 250 places in the community. Now, some of them sustain it for long periods of time. Some do it for a while and then have to stop. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's dependent upon that one courageous volunteer champion who really pushes the effort for a period of time and then after some point just can't. Uh, the Woodbury Pantry is very well known. They're very well regarded. Um, and they've been doing it for a long time very successfully. Um, I always have trouble when I talk to churches because I, I feel obligated to bring up the fact that I know you're doing this out of the goodness of your heart, and you're doing this because of the teachings of Jesus Christ, and you feel very strongly about it, and I don't disparage people on that. But what I say is, if you're still doing this a year from now, still seeing the same families, you gotta ask yourself, at what point are you helping or are you hurting? Mm. You know, and is that amount of effort it should be going into helping people with emergency food, or should you be trying to help them get into jobs? Mm. And um, I think that that's a tough question for the churches to answer, because you're talking about a much higher level of, of commitment, and I, I never disparage the churches for what they're doing. It's just one of those things that our community didn't used to have food pantries. You know, in 1980, there were 40 food banks in the United States. Food, the banks are the, the suppliers for the, the like large second pantry, harvest. Second harvest. They're now over 4,000. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's it's not always been there. You know, alms for the poor and support like that has been around. It's an ancient issue. But the idea of organized programs that solicit food to then hand out to people in need over an extended period of time. I'm not sure that's a natural phenomenon and that should continue in the United States, except in emergencies like after hurricanes, tornadoes, or an immediate crisis in the aftermath of being homeless. So there, there's a, that, that whole system, I think, over the next 10 to 20 years, I think has to be looked at a little bit. Do you think there's a receivership um, aspect to people continually being Receiving food? I would, I would refer to it as uh, entitlement, yeah. And not in the way you might think of entitlement. But, you know, a gift once is appreciated. You know, a, a gift uh, two and three times is expected. A gift four and five times, you're starting to feel entitled to it. And, that, you know, well, I'm taking this advantage of this because it is out there in the community. You know, if I were in that situation, I would be doing the same thing. So I, I don't blame anybody for it. It just requires some bigger thinking. So you talk a lot about mental health, substance abuse, especially in the communities around our immediate community. What kind of support is there to help people with those types of issues, medical help, um, institutional help? Are there any? Yeah. So with um, substance abuse, much more than mental health issues. Mental health is a tremendous number of opportunities for people to get help if you have insurance. If you don't have health care insurance, your, your opportunities for for improvement or for treatment are very, very limited. So if, if you are an adult earning 65% of US poverty, you qualify for Medicaid, and that's the best way for people to get assistance because a lot of uh, healthcare providers and mental, mental healthcare providers do take Medicaid. 
Um, if it's a child who's in a household that's earning 135% of U.S. poverty, they qualify, but uh, the adults would not. So the, um, the access to mental health issues is greatest if you're in the Orange County Jail, because they, are, they have the biggest uh, services for mental health. That's just not where you want to end up. Um, and uh, uh, they're also really good at the substance abuse treatment. There's some wonderful um, uh, programs in this community, Anchor Program, which helps uh, people with extreme alcoholism and substance abuse issues. Um, there are some residential treatment facilities in this community. Some of them are anonymous, and some of them are very public about it. Um, some of them are well known uh, globally you know, in this community. But again, if you have insurance, they're great programs. If you don't, your options become severely limited. What I think of as the best programs in this community are the AA and NA programs in this community. They're very well run. They're, um, they're run by passionate people who are very committed to the steps and the programs. They're consistently run no matter where you go. Some are bigger, some are smaller. And um, we host a program like that. Uh, it has about 150 people every week that come to it. It's one of the biggest in the state. I think finding a, usually a church or a community center that has an AA or NA program is a great place to start. And also, I will tell you, the hospitals are good at this too. Now, they don't want to treat people over and over and over again. So they know if they can get that person into a treatment program, that might be the best way to keep them out of their emergency room. And so Florida Hospital, Orlando Health, they're actually really good at this too. Um, does your program include the Medicaid Um, so we just applied for a Department of Justice grant in partnership with the Orange County um, uh, Jail System and the um, Orange County Bar Association. We don't, we don't know if we received that yet. That would be to hire staff specifically for that purpose. We already work with people <coughs> immediately released from prison, and we're one of the um, more common stops for people released from, from jail here at the Orange County Jail that um, have no other recourse for support. Um, I've had opportunity to talk to people who are released from jail uh, for a murder conviction that had spent over 50 years in jail and came to our site first. I've had that happen twice. Um, we had a lot more people who've come out of prison because of a drug conviction. You know, most people that are in the jail system in the United States are there because of a drug uh, conviction. Um, that's actually changing um, a lot in, in Orange County. They've, they've actually made some changes here in Orange and Osceola County, so people aren't going to jail for possession uh, offenses as often. And that's lightening the load on a lot of people. But our systems, whether you're immediately out of prison or you're in any other situation, they're no different. Um, the, the, the idea here is that the people who are homeless, they lack support. The people coming out of prison, they usually lack support. They all go to the same place. The trick with people with a um, criminal conviction is that becomes one of the hardest barriers to employment. And so we have, uh, are constantly building up a database of employers in this community who will hire people with criminal background record. And the number one thing that I do, just personally, to try and uh, avoid that is every time I have the opportunity to talk to kids, I always um, make sure I say one thing, which is never, ever, ever break the law. And not because it's a cool thing to say, but because it will ruin your life. You will struggle to find a job, you will struggle to find an apartment, you will struggle to find a spouse. You will struggle to get a bank account. You will struggle with everything the rest of your life. And that's one of the things that um, I like to share with parents when I go and speak to parent groups too, is you need to scare the hell out of your children and not in a funny way. You know, you need to really take them to the jail on a tour. You know, you need to talk to them about the system because um, it's, not a, it's not a small thing. Um, the uh, 33%, 34%, excuse me, all adult Americans in the United States have at least one arrest on their record, 34%. That's a Department of Justice stat that came out in July of 2016, and it was staggering for that to be released. Um, the U.S. incarcerates a higher percentage of its population than any uh, country on the planet in the history of the world. And so um, the prison systems and, and the prison population, that is a, it's a huge issue. I could spend a whole other two hours talking just about that. Um, but we got to have to keep children out of jail. Like it just it, it ruins people's lives. Maybe 100 years from now, we'll have figured out judicial systems better than that. Um, because I am of the opinion that if you served your time, you know you should be able to go back to work. But I will tell you that it's harder for 
a person with a shoplifting bust to get a job at Starbucks than a, a person with a murder conviction under them. Because people will not hire you if you've stolen something to do retail work. They just will not do it. And um, that's it's crazy, but it's true. I don't know if I really answered your question. There's no great answers to it, but that's the answer. I'm sure you said this for now, but is, is homelessness increasing in Central Florida or remaining the same? Nobody really knows. If you look at what's called the point in time count, which is a one day census done in January every year, our count numbers went down this year, but that count is highly unreliable and I've been part of that census and it's nice to do, but I don't think it's very reliable. I think the better indicator is when you watch wage growth and the unemployment rate in this community that has a direct relationship with the rate of homelessness. Our um, unemployment rate has continue to go down, but our wages in the second quarter of this year also went down. Uh, from 2005 to 2015, there were five communities in the United States who saw a relative drop in wages overall. Um, and one of those was Atlanta, Memphis, Detroit, um, Memphis, Detroit, New Orleans, and Orlando. Um, I'm not sure about the New Orleans, but I have to think about that. But it was 5.5% decrease in wages over a 10-year period of time from 05 to 15. That's post-Great Recession. So if you watch the wage levels and you watch unemployment, you see people say, well, unemployment rate, you know, unemployment rate, and some of you may know this very well, some may not. That doesn't mean the number of people who are unemployed. That means the number of people who have applied for unemployment insurance and, or unemployment benefits. And so the number of people not working is not just 3.4%. There's a much greater a lot of people who just have stopped looking for work because their barriers to employment, like criminal record, are too high. Did I answer your question? Not really. <laughs> okay, quick question. Can you um, explain what the Commission on Homelessness is? And sure. also, I know I've heard a lot about the HOPE team that goes out and works with individuals. Yeah. So the Commission on Homelessness has been around in, in our community for uh, over 15 years. Um, it is a effort between multiple different private and public businesses and nonprofits in the community to try and coordinate efforts and mostly to bring light to the issue in the community. The, the commission doesn't do any type of direct service. They are a convening body to try and both raise money and awareness around the problem. They are the group that um, developed the Rethink Homelessness campaign that some people may have seen that had the cardboard sign on billboards in town, trying to make sure that people were aware that we had the largest chronically homeless population um, it's run now by a wonderful woman named Shelley Lawton, um, uh, who she never says is, and it's really not critical, it's just interesting. Her, her husband is Chief Judge Fred Lawton, who's Chief Judge for the Ninth Judicial Circuit. A uh, wonderful couple, um, and she's doing everything she can to try and convene as many different initiatives as possible, bringing everybody together. That's their, that's their main thing, is that convening and making sure that their homelessness is an important and driving issue for everybody. So she visits the mayor re regularly, she has a board of like 60 people who are all you know, major CEOs and leaders in the community and they are very aggressively working on this. The incoming chair uh, that's taking Dr. Hunter's place is uh, David Swanson, who's the lead pastor at First Presbyterian in downtown Orlando. He's an amazing man. Um, the uh, HOPE team is a division of another agency that has two names like mine. It's called the Healthcare Center for the Homeless. It's also known as Orange Blossom Family Health. It's kind of like I'm United, I'm United Against Poverty, but that's not on my building because nobody wants to come to an organization called United Against Poverty, so publicly we refer to ourselves as Up Orlando. Publicly, they're Orange Blossom Family Health, but the HOPE team is a team of um, uh, really courageous individuals that get out into the woods to behind the shopping centers, uh, and they get out there and talk to everybody, anybody who's struggling, and they get them registered in the system through, um, there's an assessment process that they get people into. It's called the Vulnerability Index Assessment. Uh, it's called VI SPDAT. I still don't know what the SPDAT stands for. Uh, but that assessment is what gets people into the registry. And this is going to be a lot of complicated words, but all you re all really need to know is that there is a system that if you're in the registry, it's a queue system that sorts people based on their severity of homelessness or the need. And as an available housing is there, they match it up. and 
try to put people in housing, which is it's a phenomenal system. I'm very proud of it. I had nothing to do with it, but I'm very proud that it exists, uh, that I'm part of it, that we put data into it. The downside is there's not nearly enough housing to meet the, the need. So uh, we've done half our job. The other half is it just has to be a lot more affordable housing. There's um, a new housing development opening up. It was actually on the radio today. Um, the rent is $650 a month as opposed to you know, $1,100 a month. Um, there is nothing available in Orange County right now for less than $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't exist. So it's um, if you do know something less than that, please let me know because I have people who try to find places to live that are living in their cars. So that is the relationship between the Hope team and uh, the commission. And they all we all work together. Phenomenal groups. It's actually a lot of fun. They're really good people. I've gone an hour and 15 minutes, which is way more time than anybody should have to listen to one person talk. It's five times as long as Pastor Joe does at University of Carolina Methodist, where he goes. So, um, thank you for doing what you yes. do. Yes. Thank, thank you guys for listening, and thank you for having me. Yes, and uh, yeah. please take care of yourself. Um, yeah, one more thing. Um, we want to thank Eric for coming today uh, for all the great information. And for the Avalon Park Foundation, if you guys can share this video, please. Um, there's a lot of people that are very interested in the information on homelessness and how we can help. Um, on the Avalon Park Foundation website, we'll also have a list of the resources. So we'll have UPS information, the United Way, um, the three emergency shelters that you've mentioned today, and I'll get with you to make sure we have all those on there. But um, we'll have those on our Avalon Park Foundation site, and then of course the video, if you guys can just help to share that. If anyone wanted to be here, could it make it? This is the reason why we're doing the videos now, so they can watch it at home whenever they, they can. So thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.